Okay, um, welcome. Um, so this is kind of, this is the uh, second video on this topic here. Um, so in the first video, we covered um, some of the um, things about basic probability, so a, a quick introduction and random variables, and then we got up to probability distributions. So we kind of defined uh, what what discrete and continuous um, probability distributions were. So in this video, um, we're going to be looking at um, some specific examples of both discrete and continuous probability distributions. Okay, so these are these are you know um, uh, very useful. Um, so so you come across these a lot, but especially probably the normal Gaussian distribution that we'll talk about. I mean, if there's one of any distribution that somebody who you know, a science major, computer science major, should be familiar with. It's the normal or the Gaussian distribution. So uh, we'll get to that and look at it. Um, all right. So, um, so we'll, but we'll start off um, looking at uh, three uh, discrete distributions. Um, um, and uh, I'm going to try to keep these brief um, on talking to these. There's, there's quite a bit of information on these, but... Um, um, so we'll just talk about the basics of them. Um, so a binomial distribution, um, we already saw some examples of this. Um, uh, really, anytime you're repeating a trial, re repeating trials of independent events where you have a binary outcome, so basically flipping coins are, are um, the prototypical example of, of a Bernoulli, what's known as a Bernoulli trial. Um, and a Bernoulli process is just when you do that repeatedly, right? So the important things um, for this, and, and, and so the random variable that represents the count of the number of successes. So, so when you have two outcomes, um, in the, 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 abs, the, the most abstract way to think of it is one of them is a successful outcome and one is a failure outcome. So if, if we were flipping coins, we would pick one of them. Like, like if, if we called heads, that would be the success for us. So. Um, so anyway, anytime you're just counting up the number of successes, like, like counting the number of heads, um, that the, the random variable that describes that in, is a what's known as a binomial random variable. So, <clears throat> so all these have to be true for to have a binomial random variable um, that's counting up a uh, Bernoulli process. Uh, it has to consist of repeated trials. Um, each trial. Um, can be classified as a success or a failure. So these are uh, um, binary, so, so the outcome is binary. Um, the probability of success um, is denoted by P, um, and it remains the same from trial to trial. So, so your probability of success doesn't change uh, for the different independent trials that you run, right? So for, the, for a fair coin, the probability of success is going to be 0.5 or 1 half, right? But you, know, you, the, you can use this in general to model um, Bernoulli trials where the probability is, is not equal, right? So, um, so we'll, we'll have an example of that. Um, and probably the most important, the, the repeated trials have to be independent, right? So if, if there's dependency, you you're probably need to use a hypergeometric distribu distribution instead. So, um, so, so yeah, we, we did this. Uh, so, so if, if you follow along with the, the lecture notebook that I have for this material, um, I, I go through here kind of deriving by hand. So uh, for all of these, I mean, it's a good exercise. You, you can derive kind of the, the final form of the expression for these by hand if you think about them a little bit. So, so I'll maybe go through this one a, a little bit um, for the binomial. I probably won't, won't do any of the other ones. Um, so we did this before in the previous video. Um, this is an example of a Bernoulli trial where we're flipping coins. Uh, we're going to be just doing uh, n equals 3 trials here. So one of the parameters of, of a binomial variable is the number of repeated trials that you're going to do. So, so we're doing 3. Um, and um, we're, like I said, we're defining head as success. So we're counting up the number of heads. So, you know, you can enumerate all the possibilities, and that would tell you what the what the if the coin is fair. This tells you what the probability is, and so you can work it out by hand by just enumerating the possibilities. So, since there's only way one way of getting three heads, uh, we know that the overall way of getting um, you know uh, the the binomial variable of three, which means that we saw three successes, is 
0.125 or 1 and 8, right? Um, and there's only one way of getting no head, so that's also 0.125. And then there's uh, three ways, respectively, of getting one head or two head, so you have a 0.375 chance. So that's the actual, this is the actual discrete distribution of this, of, of this experiment where we're flipping three coins, and since this experiment is a binomial variable, that is the actual distribution of a binomial, binomial variable where the probability is 0.5 of getting to success, um, and we're doing three repeated trials, so n is three, all right? Um, so, we can use the tools that we talked about in the previous video to come up with a, a, a general expression um, that, that would, we could apply to any uh, such binomial variable, you know, where n is 4, 5, or 6, and where the probability of success is, is something besides 0.5, so whatever the probability of success is. So that, that's what we're trying to do here, is, is derive that expression, right? Um, so here um, is kind of the, the, the first stab at it, right? So, um, so we can use the, the, the idea of, of counting the number of combinations of in things taken x at a time to figure out this first question. So how many ways are there uh, among three things of getting um, three of them, right, of getting three successes? So, so, so three take three is one. So that, that tells us there's one out of the eight way of getting three successes. And, and the same thing, three getting zero also would give you one here. Uh, but if you ask uh, among, so, so having three successes, how many are there of getting ways of getting two of the, the items to be successes out of the three trials? That would be three take two or three take one. And that would, that'll come up with three, okay? But in general, again, you know, using this, um, to count the number of, of combinations of, of basically how many successes would we, how many ways are there getting X successes among N trials, right? So, so this would work in general, whatever the number of trials N's are and whatever, whatever the number of successes X is that you want to count up, right? So, so that's kind of how we use that. So given that, then all you have to do is, is you have to be able to figure out the probability. And, and we mentioned this last time, um, um, so since the probabilities are equal, um, another way of, of counting the, the, figuring out the probability of each one of these is by using the product rule of probabilities. So we know that, that this probability has to be one-half times one-half times one-half, or one-eighth again, right? Um, and since, all, since the probability of tails and heads are equal, you can just uh, use, uh, it's just one-half to the n. So it's going to be one-half to the three when n is three, um, but it's going to be one-half or one over two to the n, uh, or equivalently, you can say one half raised to the nth power. You get the same expression here, right? So if n was four or five, if n was four, it would be uh, one sixteenth, or, or one half to the power of four would be the probability of each one of those, because there would be sixteen possible outcomes. Okay. So, but, but anyway, from that expression, then um, um, you know you can use that to recreate the table that we kind of did by hand here of the binomial variable. That, that will come up with the, the binomial variable um, for, for uh, n equals three trials where probability of success is one half, right? But the important thing here to realize though is that this works in general no matter what n is um, and it actually works in general no matter what p is because um, you know if n is four or five you just plug that in and you can calculate it for uh, the, the, the this discrete distribution for uh, four repeated trials or five repeated trials or how many repeated trials you have. And if your probability is something besides one half, um, um, you have to do something slightly different. So, so we do have to add into the notation. I'll jump down to it. Um, so when the probability is, is, is something besides one half, you have to, to find, you know, so, so like for two, two successes, but where the probability, where we have an unfair coin and the probability of, of the heads is one-third, we want to multiply one-third times one-third. That's going to be the probability of, of getting two heads in a row here. But, um, so, so since, the, since this is an unfair coin, you know, the, it, it's a little bit different for, for these other cells here. It's not always one-third times one-third. So, so since there's a probability of two-thirds of getting the tails, it's two-thirds times two-thirds, okay? So if you use P to represent the probability of success, one-third, and you use Q, which is going to be the complement, since there's only two outcomes here, so Q is just one minus that, and that, you can think of that as the probability of failure. Um, 
So here, this is going to be Q times Q um, for, for a two-trial uh, experiment. And for these, you have one success and one failure. So it's, it's going to be one-third times two-thirds, or, or P times Q um, is your probability for these, so two ninths, all right? But the general expression is, is that, you know, if there's X successes, uh, there has to be n minus x failures. So to figure out the probability of, of one of these rows, you know, of, of your um, discrete distribution, it's, it's p to the power of x times q to the n minus x, all right? So that, that gives you the final piece, right? So if you look at any um, textbook or, or, or if you look up on Wikipedia the expression for um, a... Um, binomial distribution, it, it's this expression, and, and that's how we derive it. So, so the parameters here, let, let, let me say a little bit about this. So x are the number of successes that we're going to calculate. So that's kind of an actual parameter. Um, and, and you notice it's a little bit subtle, but in the, in the notation there's a semicolon here. That, re that, that separates x uh, from n and p. n and p are more like metaparameters in this case. So um, for one binomial distribution, uh, I mean, n and p are going to be fixed. So the number of trials that we want to run um, and the probability of success. But then we want to come up with the probability then for uh, what's the probability of getting zero successes, and, and that's what x is, or the probability of getting one success or two successes or whatever. So, um, so, so yeah, and then you can use this to plug in um, and calculate that. And again, this works in general, you know, um, not just for... The, the, the three successes and the probability of success is one half, but for any number of trials in and, and any probability of success. Um, and so we're, and P is probably success and Q is the probability of failure here. So, um, so uh, a, a quick example. Um, so here's something. Um, um, so binomial distributions are used a lot in manufacturing, for example. So, so if you're doing quality control, uh, you might check your manufacturing process by um, doing um, what are known as shot tests or, or testing to destruction. So you do that by randomly picking some number of items off your manufacturing line um, and you, testing, you test them, kind of do some extreme tests on them. Um, and you want to make certain that so for quality control, you know, you, they, you need to make certain that your products are, are not failing too often, so, so that some number of them. So it's, it's deemed that your quality is sufficient as long as, you know, um, some number of, of your um, items don't, uh, don't fail when you test them like this. So uh, anyway, um, we, can, we can model what we would expect to see the failure if, if we know, for example, what the probability of, of survival is. So here, probability of surviving the test is, is going to be our success um, condition here. So it's three and four. So, so we can ask it. So, so if we pick four components at random, what's, what's the probability that zero components would, would survive? Should be pretty low since they have a three out of four, uh, or what's the probability that four all four components would survive? Right. Um, so, so I mean, this this is a, a binomial distribution where n is four and a probability of success. Oops, typo in the textbook. It's actually we're doing it with n is four here, um, and probability of success is three fourths. Um, so there should be sixteen possible outcomes. But of course, the individual probabilities are not equal, so, so you're going to get different ones for each of these rows. Um, and, and, but yeah, this is kind of doing it by hand then, enumerating all the possibilities. Uh, so we, we, we should get this exact same um, discrete distribution here if we use the, our formula for the binomial distribution. So we could write the function by hand. So here, using the com function, which comes out of um, um, the scipy stats has the com functions where we um, um, uh, imported that from, if, if you look up above here. Um, um, so again, we, we, we just have those three parameters here, but, but you know, n and p are kind of like metaparameters. We, we expect n and p in these functions to be regular scalar values, so, so it doesn't really make sense to calculate, I mean it does, but, but, but in this function we, we just want n to be a single number, the number of trials for the binomial distribution we want to um, 
represent here, and P is the probability of success. But X uh, can be like a vector. So this is a vectorized function in the sense that if I want to calculate all of the um, probabilities for getting 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 successes, I can pass in um, a vector for X instead of just a, a scalar value and, and get them all at once. So, so, and we show that exactly here. So, so um, um, and, 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 and again, this is just that formula that, that we showed in mathematical notation up above and derived here. So n takes t n take x successes times the probability of having that x successes times the probability of having those q uh, uh, those fa those n minus x failures q's failures. Um, so so yeah, if, if you can use that function, you should get the same result that you had here for the binomial distribution for four trials with the probability of success is three-fourths, um, and, and, and you can see it is the same. Um, so this should make sense. I mean, you, you can't, so if, if we have n trials, uh, it only makes sense to have values for your number of successes from zero up to n for a binomial distribution. So you can't have five successes in, in, in four trials, right? Or any more than n. So, so, so this is a you know this is a discrete distribution because um, um, the outcome, the random variable, is discrete, um, and this is an example of a finite discrete distribution. There's only going to be a, a finite number of, um, of 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 actual results on our um, random variable uh, here. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, if, if I needed to work with a binomial distribution, I wouldn't write the function by hand. Um, although, you know, I'm pretty certain that there's no bug in there. So, I mean, that, that should be the right one. But um, I'd use scipy sci dot stats functions has functions. Uh, actually, these are classes um, for um, for all of the, the the major discrete and continuous probability distributions that you would. Uh, need to use so the, the ones we talk about plus others you know so, so lots of them lots of others are, are in there if you ever need one um, so, so the way you normally use these in, in Python SciPy uh, is you import um, this is basically a class a, an object and then when you make when you make an instance of the to we there's there's other ways you can use these but to, to me the way that makes most sense is you create an instance of the object uh, using basically the meta parameters. Um, the, um, so in this case, our number of trials is four, and our probability of success is three fourths. So, so that kind of represents the, the the binomial random variable that we're interested in. And then once you have that object, you can um, calculate things like the, the the probability mass function. So uh, again, we, we talked about this in the previous video. That this represents the probability mass function for this discrete random variable. So, so if I want to get those values, um, I, I just have to ask, okay, what's the probability of uh, the probability of mass function for uh, zero successes, where x is zero? Um, so, so here I just did it in the loop so we could get it, uh, get out the, um, the table again. But, but this, the, the PMF is vectorized, so um, Um, you should be able to call it also with a, um, an array. So if I give it a, an array, um, this should be give me the values from 0 to 4, basically. Um, so we should get the same thing um, um, just all at once, basically. Right? Um, all right. So anyway, yep. So that's our binomial distribution. Um, there's other functions. Uh, we'll, 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 I'll talk about a few other functions that you can use when you instantiate one of these classes that represents a distribution from SciPy stats. So, um, uh, but, so, uh, so we'll look next at like the continuous mass function as well. So um, again, just a reminder of some of the things we talked about. So. To be a proper discrete distribution, the sum of the, the, the probability masses, the sum of probabilities, has to add up to one. Um, so it does, you know, so if you check that, you, know, you double check that. Um, so it says, yeah, for our n equals four trials with a probability of success of 0.75, this is our actual probability mass function. So this is another way. So, you, so for discrete probabilities, you can represent these as tables, or you can represent these, um, you know, one visual way is just as a, as a histogram or like a bar graph. 
So these are x. So this should make sense, you know, if you're looking at it. So since the probability of success is three out of four, you're most likely to get three successes um, and, and four successes, and you're less likely to only get, you know, you're very unlikely to get to see zero successes uh, if you do this. And there's a small probability, but but it's pretty small, um, uh, less than one percent. So. Um, yeah, and, and I, I think later on in this video we'll, we'll talk about uh, how cumulative distributions, the cumulative distribution function um, can be useful. Um, but, but yeah, so you can use like the CDF to get the computer. So again, this is really just adding up. So, so the, the cumulative distribution of zero is just the same as zero, but the cumulative distribution of one is the sum of zero plus one. So it's going to be like... Uh, 0 0.05 a little bit. The cumulative distribution of 2 is, is, is 0 plus 1 plus 2. Right? So and when you get to the end, that should sum up to 1. So the cumulative distribution of, one, of 4 is the, the, the probability of seeing 4 or, or smaller um, successes for the random variable here, so, which should be 1. So, so you have to see a result of, of 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 successes, basically, is what this is saying. So, All right, um, so that was a binomial distribution. Um, so like I said, um, I'm, I'm going to go through a little bit quicker um, the, the, our other discrete distributions here. Um, the hypergeometric distribution then uh, um, is another useful one. So the main use for this one is if, you, if your trials are not independent. So, so if you have some dependency, um, and again, this, this is very common. Um, so all trials of binomial must be independent. But for hypergeometric, um, um, we, we, formalize, we formalize it in, in a similar way. So we think about it in terms of the probability of selecting x successes from k items labeled successes. So here we're, we're formulating it as kind of a sample problem. So the reason why there's dependency in this case, uh, so again, so think of drawing balls from a bag. Uh, but we're going to be drawing without replacement. So, um, so, so, you know, in the bag we might have four balls that are successes, um, so, so four, like the black balls we'll consider a success if we draw a black ball. So we might have four black balls and three white balls, um, but when we draw a ball out we don't put it back in. So that, that means that our, our trials, our samples are dependent upon each other. When we draw the first ball, there's going to be a different probability now of, of having a success when we draw the second ball, and so on. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of how we formulate um, the hypergeometric. Um, so here, the, the parameters are x is, is, is again the, the same random variable, um, uh, the same kind of random variable. It's the count of the number of successes, like we had for the binomial distribution. Um, n represents the number, the total number of items that we're sampling from when we start sampling, right? So in the example I was just talking about, there were seven balls in total in the bag with four black and three white. So in big N would be seven. Uh, and then here, um, 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 N is again the number of, in this case, it's the number of samples we're going to take. So, so N was the number of trials for the binomial. Here it's the number of, of items we're going to sample from our big N um, um, uh, collection of items, but, but again, we're sampling without replacement, so there's dependency. Uh, and then K is the number of, of successes. Uh, it, it's the number of items that represent success in the sample. So, so K, if, if, black, if I have four black balls, I consider drawing a black ball being success. K is going to be four. Um, and then like, like we did for P and Q, um, um, N minus um, K uh, uh, sorry, big N minus K represents the number of failures, the, the number of items that would be a failure if, if you sampled them. So, um, all right. So uh, again, I won't go through the derivation this time. It's not too tough to, to kind of come up with this formula on your own, but this represents the um, discrete hypergeometric distribution uh, for those given those four parameters. Um, if, you, if you calculate this, this will tell you the probability of getting, you know, x's, however many successes uh, sampled from, from the experiment with these parameters. Uh, the number of items total, um, where we're sampling small n number of items, and there's k successes uh, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the bag or, or whatever. Um, 
possible. So. Um, okay. So again, let's go back to, um, um, let, let's just make it a little bit more concrete and, and calculate some things with these. Um, so, so yeah, if we have a bag with 100 balls in it, so to make it a little bit more complicated here, so, so big N is 100, but we've only got 20, um, so I'm flipping here, so, so we've got 20 white balls and, and 80 black balls, and we're going to be considering a white ball a success. So, so K is 20 here. Um, um, white balls are successes. We've got 20 of them out of the 100. Um, and we're going to draw five items without replacement. Um, so so samples, we're sampling five items. Right? So then we can ask, you know, what's the probability of drawing zero white balls, so zero successes, or one success, or two success, or three success, or four, or five? So, so here, you know, um, uh, X can, can go from zero up to five. We, um, um, since we're sampling five, we can get no more than five successes. Again, kind of similar to like we, we had before. So. so yeah, we could plug in by hand. So if I want to know what's the probability of getting three white balls, so three successes. So, so the probability, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit less. There's only, only one-fifth of the bag is white balls and three-fifths is black balls. So, so it's probably pretty unlikely, you shouldn't intuitively see, it's going to be in, pretty unlikely to get a large number of white balls. We expect maybe to get one. So, so yeah, since there's one in one in five of the balls is white balls, we, probably the most likely probability is drawing just one in the sample. Uh, but anyway, if you want to know the probability of getting three, yeah, it's a little bit less than 5%. Um, and if you want to know the probability uh, the, of, of all of them, you know, you want to calculate the, the, the hypergeometric discrete distribution for all the possibilities from zero to five white balls or zero to five successes here, right? So, um, so yeah, the, the, um, there's a function in SciPy stats called hypergeom for the hypergeometric distribution. All these functions have the same API. So if it's a discrete probability function, it has a PMF function um, to, to calculate the probability mass function. It has a, a CDF function to calculate the cumulative distribution. Um, so yeah, here's our total discrete distribution for this hypergeometric um, that we just described. Um, so, yeah, so there's a 42% chance of drawing one white ball, 30, 31%. So there's a 72% chance, if you look at the cumulative, of, of getting only zero or one success, right? Um, and then the other 30% chance is, you know, getting, a, uh, getting two or more, basically. So, um, so yeah, and, and our, our distribution, if you, if you want to visualize it, looks like that. And then, and then you can get the, the cumulative using the CDF function. Um, you can get something like that here. So, um, so again, you know, using the cumulative, looking at this, what this tells you is that it's, it's very likely to get zero, one, or two successes. You're already up above 90%, right? Um, and, and, and most of the, the probability doesn't exist past that. So you get quite a bit less after getting for more than two successes. So. Um, oh, so um, uh, here, uh, I can't remember uh, so th this, if, if I didn't do this before in the previous video, here's, here's is an example of a Monte Carlo simulation, right? So, so this might be complicated enough that, okay, I mean, do we really believe uh, that that... Uh, Derivation for the hypergeometric uh, distribution is correct or not, right? So, I mean, if you, if you didn't believe it, or if you wanted to double check it, you could run the again. You could run the experiment in real life. We could get a bag and, and, and draw the balls, and, and we'd have to run. We'd have to do that a lot to, to, to make certain that we were approaching the true probabilities. But you could do that, or we could set up uh, basically a, a computer simulation to do it for us. As long as our random number generator is random enough, is, is a good enough random number generator. Um, this would be just as good as doing it, the experiment in real life better because we can, we can run it millions and millions of times to, to really get, um, uh, to make certain that the probabilities are coming out. So, so here, basically, you know, this is some good Python code to understand. So we basically create a, a set, a bag here, where we, uh, we're using strings. Um, so, so, so we've got 20, 20 strings in this array 
that, that have the value white, and we have 80 in the string that, value, that have the value black, um, and we're going to be drawing without replacement from this bag, from this set here. So, so here, um, um, here's another useful, so there's a lot of useful functions in NP random. So choice allows you to, to sample from like an array, um, like an umpy array or a regular Python array. Um, and you can sample with or without replacement. So if you say replace is false, we'll be sampling without replacement. So we'll get so our trials or our samples are going to be dependent by saying replace is false here. Um, and we sample n, so n is 5 here. We want to draw 5 balls. And then we can just count up. So sample equals white. Um, so since this returns a NumPy array, um, this will um, turn it into a Boolean result, so you end up with a Boolean NumPy array. And then if you sum up a Boolean, uh, trues uh, are equivalent to one. So basically this has the, the result of, of adding up all, all of the successes, all the balls that were white, uh, which is our random variable basically that we're trying to get here. Um, yeah, so in, in this example, we ran it 10,000 times, and, and you should go back and compare that to the, the, the table here. So again, it won't be exactly the same, but it should pre, pretty well confirm. So this will probably three, two, three, four uh, decimal digits when we run 10,000 times uh, will be in agreement uh, here for the most part. And if you want to be more, more sure, you, know, you, should, you should try increasing that to a million or, or, or a billion even. It won't take all that long to run it a billion times and, and um, uh, confirm the, this discrete distribution here. So. Um, all right, the, the final one that I'll mention is the Poisson distribution. I mostly mention this because it is an important one in computer science um, and in data analytics and in industry. Uh, lots of things are governed by Poisson distributions. Um, so basically in computer science, there, there's a, a field of mathematics called queuing theory, uh, and, and lots of things in, in manufacturing and in computer science uh, you can model as queues arriving, uh, as things arriving on a queue. So like, like in computer science, um, um, like, like maybe packets arriving in a, in a network uh, coming into your computer, you, you have to queue them up. So their arrival times are, are well modeled by a Poisson distribution. Um, or jobs arriving or starting in a supercomputer um, are often a good, um, are often distributed by a Poisson distribution. Um, so here, one, the Poisson random variable is a little bit different from the first two because uh, in theory, um, the number of, of arrivals, um, so, so here the random variable is going to be the number of arrivals in some amount of time, okay? So, so when we think of a Poisson distribution, we're, we're, we're counting, uh, again, it, it's discrete. We're counting up the, the discrete number of arrivals in some amount of time. Um, so it could be the number of people that arrive at, at the bank in, in an hour of time. Uh, in physics, this is used a lot. It could be like the number of particles that decay in a millisecond of time or in an hour or in 100 years or something like that. So, so, so here, um, but in theory, uh, it is open-ended. So it's not a finite, discrete, uh, random variable in this case. So, so for like the bank example, I mean, maybe it's usual that you have 10 customers arrive per hour during the day. But uh, sometimes you have rare events. Um, so, so a stock market might crash, and all of a sudden you've got a thousand people lining up, or ten thousand people, right? So, so the Poisson random variable has to be kind of uh, non-finite; has to be unbounded, but it is still discrete. So, um, anyway, so, so, so for something to be governed by a Poisson distribution, it has to have these properties. The number of outcomes occurring in one time interval. You can also use this a Poisson distribution if, if, like, if you're counting the number of objects uh, in like a, 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 a bounded space. So this is used to to, to model like the the growth of bacteria on a, like a square centimeter in a medium or something like that. Or you might be counting the number of field mice that are in a square kilometer or something like that. And, and they're often. Um, follow a Poisson distribution when you're doing things like that as well. Um, so here, uh, but, but Poisson um, 
are independent, like the binomial. So, so what happens in one time period is completely independent from what happens on the next one, um, um, or it has to be in order to be a good Poisson. Um, so uh, that's one one place where it cues of people. Uh, so, so often it is there is some dependency, um, but but Poissons are still often good models for people queuing up in lines and things. Um, um, so the probability of a single outcome occurring during a very short time interval um, is proportional to the length of the time interval uh, or the size of the region. Um, um, so, and, and, and the probability that more than one outcome will occur in a, in a short interval uh, is negligible. So you have to worry about those too much. Um, the, the, the first one is kind of the most important here. Um, anyway, the, um, this, this formula would be a lot tougher to derive if you wanted to, to derive it by, by hand. So, so I won't kind of go into that. So, but, but there is a, a, a mathematical description. Uh, so that here, basically, you've only got two uh, parameters. Uh, um, um, X, again, is the count of the number of things arriving, um, you know, 0, 1, 2, or whatever. But again, it's not finite in this case. Um, and lambda t is what I talked about. L lambda is, is the, really the only parameter. So, so you often use like a unit time interval, like one hour or one day or whatever. In that case, t is just one. Uh, and then lambda is, is the average that you normally see uh, that governs this this interval. So if you, if you normally see 10 people arrive per hour at your business, lambda would be 10 and t would be 1, 1 hour. So. Um, all right. So, um, so like I said, I, I'll just um, kind of show this. So, so again, we could, we could get an instance of, of a Poisson object from scipy.stats in order to um, plot the probability mass function and the cumulative mass function for it. Um, so, but it, again, it is unbounded. Um, so, so if you plotted it, uh, you'll see that. Like, so here, lambda was ten, uh, and t was one. Um, so, so it's most probable. You see most of the, the probability around ten, around nine, ten, and eleven. Uh, but uh, if you go out here, even above twenty-five, there's still like a small, very small probability. But, but, but there is, there does exist some probability of, of seeing twenty-five or fifty, even though the average. In, in this Poisson distribution is 10. So, so that means to actually sum up to 1, um, so yeah, if I sum up only the first 25, uh, it didn't, didn't quite reach 1. It, it, it's, it's close uh, to four decimal digits. I'd have to sum up to like 1,000 to, to get it to like 8 or like 10 or 12 decimal places of 1 or something like that. So. Um, Okay, so yeah, so those were the those were discrete distributions that we looked at. So um, now I want to turn to looking at some continuous probability distributions. We'll just look at two, and we'll look at our first one uh, quickly. Um, so the first one we'll mention is the uniform distribution. Um, so this this is a very simple distribution. It's continuous, uh, but it's still very useful. So, so we use uniform distributions a lot. Okay, so in a sense, um, you can also have you can also have uh, uniform discrete distributions, uh, kind of. So, um, for example, thinking about rolling a dice. Uh, so, so whenever you have equal probabilities, that that that's an example of being uniform. So, so if you have a fair dice um, where, where we have six outcomes, each one is equally uh, likely. Um, so you can you can you can call that 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 they're, that they're uniformly distributed, right? Um, uh, Any one is equally likely to occur with the other. So for a, a uniform continuous distribution, um, you, we mean uniform in the same way. There's equally likely probability of, of any value occurring within the, the the range. Okay. So for a uniform distribution. Um, um, oh, um, yeah, let me skip over that. So, a uniform distribution, we, we normally define it over an interval. So, um, 
So for example, we, we, the, and the, the one that we most use for a uniform distribution is, is on the, the unit interval. So we might create, up a, un, create a unit uniform distribution over the interval from zero to one. So in that case, the begin of, so, so here, for the probability density function that, that describes the continuous uniform distribution, uh, the parameter x is the random variable, but in, in this case now for continuous um, probability distributions, x is now a continuous value. So you should think of that as like a, a floating point value or, or a real number, basically. Uh, and then here a and b are metaparameters. So a is the beginning of the, the interval and b is the end of the interval that x can range within, right? So, so if we're using the unit interval 0 to 1, a would be 0 and b would be 1, right? So the, the prob what's known as the probability density function is going to be when, when a is 0 and b is 1, b minus a is just 1, right? So the probability density function is 1 uh, whenever you're between a and b and is 0 everywhere else, okay? Um, so let's plot that and then I'll come back to that. So, so it looks like this, okay? Um, so, so the 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 the, the probability density function for the uniform uh, where the interval is from 0 to 1 is 1 between 0 and 1 is 0 everywhere else, right? So, so this is a little Python function that's vectorized but that um, implements um, uh, this here so that we can plot it and, and we can use it. Um, this, this implements this piecewise function here. So, so when, when x is between 0 and 1, we return 1.0 or, or b minus a, and when it's outside of that range, we return 0. Um, so here, let's go back. Remember, for a continuous probability uh, distribution, uh, it had three properties, basically. The first two were that um, um, the, the, the probability, so we use small f of x to mean the probability density for our, our probability distribution. It has to be greater than or equal to 0 for all x uh, in, in the real number, so for all x from negative infinity to infinity, right? So you should see, I mean, that's the case. I mean, it's zero for most of, most of it, so everywhere below zero and, and above one, the probability is zero, but, but it is, you know, zero. And, and then everywhere else, it's one, so, so it is greater than, 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 than zero. It's greater than or equal to zero everywhere, right? So, so it passes that first test for being a continuous probability distribution. The other one, though, is that the, the integral, basically the sum of the probability uh, density, has to add up to 1 for it to be a, 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 a proper continuous probability distribution, right? So is that the case? So, so we talked about integrals in this class, right? So, I mean, it should be also for this one, this one's so simple, but it should be obvious that the area under this is 1 because it's a it's a, it's a unit square with, with a, a width of 1 and a height of 1, right? So 1 times 1 is 1, so the area of this is 1. So yeah, it's a good, um, it's a good continuous probability distribution by that, right? Um, and, and then that, if you understand that, that's why uh, this expression makes sense. So, so if, if A and B were instead negative 2 to 2, I want to have a uniform distribution where I could have numbers ranging from negative 2 to 2 being sampled randomly from there. That would have a base of 4, so, so the width would be 4, so b minus a would be 4. So I'd have to have my height be 1 fourth so that the area would total up to 1 in that case. And so that, that's kind of where this comes from here. So. Um, so the other thing that we talked about, so, so now um, it, it doesn't really make sense to ask, what's the probability of getting 0.6? Uh, so, so if I randomly sample from this continuous distribution. Uh, the reason why it, it, it's kind of negligible to get 0.6 is because there's an infinite number of values between 0 and 1 here. So to get exactly, it's infinitely unlikely to get exactly 0 0.6, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 with an infinite number of zeros. I, I'm gonna get some, I can get something really close to 0.6, but, but, I, but, but if I had a true, if I was truly drawing a random number from that infinite interval, you can't really, it doesn't make sense to say how likely is it going to be. It's infinitely unlikely to be exactly that. But if you ask how probably, how probable is it to get something really close to 0.6, like between 0.59 and 0.61, right? Or, or the example I hit here, what's the probability of getting something between 0.4 and 0.6, right? 
that makes sense because that, that's that's now a, a finite interval. Um, and then to calculate that probability for a continuous probability distribution, you again just have to calculate the integral, right? So it's easy to calculate this integral by hand because if I want to know the probability of, of randomly generating a number in that interval, my, my base is 0.2 and my height is 1. So the probability is 0.2. There's, there's a 20% chance or a 2 in 10 chance of getting a number between 4 and 6 if I'm randomly drawing from a uniform, continuous uniform distribution over the interval 0 to 1, right? Um, yeah, so, and so I mean, you know, this isn't really, if you integrate that, of course, that's what you expect to get is 0.2 or 0.2, real close to 0.2, since this is a approximation of the integral. Um, so, oh, and like I said, so, you know, if, if you want to do this f for a, a different interval besides from 0 to 1, I mean, you can. So you can have a uni uniform distribution from negative 2 to 2. It would look like this, but it would now ha have a height of 1 fourth of 0.25 so that the area is still 1. So. Um, there is a SciPy stats um, object for doing uniform distributions is a bit, bit of an overkill for uniform. Um, the, the, there, is a, um, there, there is one for generating, for sampling from a uniform distribution in NumPy random library as well. So the, the NumPy version, you basically give it the begin and end of the interval. And what you find then is, is you're going to get numbers generated that, that are in the range from negative 2 to 2, and it's equally likely you'll get any number between negative 2 and two in this case, so so it's uniformly likely, right? But but again, what you get the random variable you're getting is a floating point number. It's it's continuous, right? It's a real value number. Um, <coughs> so yeah, if you want to use the, the SciPy stat one, it's 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 the same <coughs> the same interface, you know. So you create an uh, you import the object called uniform for the continuous uniform distribution. Um, it, so here, what it takes, uh, it doesn't take the begin and the interval, it, the begin and the end of the interval. It takes the, the beginning and then the width of the interval. So it's just kind of a detail. But yeah, if I want from negative two to two, I say negative, I say begin at negative two and have a width, uh, or what it calls a scale of four. So that gives you the same one. Um, and then you can use PDF. So it's not so PMF are for. Um, Discrete distributions, that, that stands for probability mass function. PDF stands for probability density function. And it's kind of technical why you call it a mass function for a discrete case and a density function for continuous, but, but conceptually it's, it's kind of the same thing. So, uh, But anyway, it's PDF um, for the continuous variables instead of PMF. But um, um, I guess I didn't show an example, of it, but, but they both call it CDF, the, the, the cumulative density function. Um, for some reason they didn't call it CMF. Um, I don't know why, it's a little bit inconsistent. So, but anyway. Um, all right, so oh, again, one last thing before I move on then to uh, normal distributions. Make certain that you understand what we mean by drawing a sample from a continuous distribution, right? So, so for the uniform, if I, if I draw random numbers from them, here I, I only drew 200 numbers. But I expect them to be just uniformly, you know, there, there's an equal chance of, of any one of these numbers uh, from negative 2 to 2 in this case. So, so if you draw them and plot them, they, they should, I mean, there is some clumping, but if I drew more, uh, they, 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 there would be even less clumping. They, they would be very evenly distributed um, across there. So. Um, All right, and then finally, let's, let's look at the normal distribution. So I want to spend at least 10 minutes here on this. Um, so the uh, normal distribution um, has a couple of different names. Uh, well, uh, um, it's also known as the Gaussian distribution, or if, or if you ever hear people talk about the bell curve, um, that's what it is. The, uh, it looks kind of like a bell-shaped like bell function. Um, so uh, again, I won't go into the derivation of this. Uh, so there's a well-known expression for this. So, so again, this is a um, continuous probability distribution. So, so x is a, 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 a continuous real-valued number. 
but but this isn't uniform, um, so it's it's a, a norm. It's normally distributed. So we have two meta parameters there in this case that govern a normal distribution. Uh, so. Uh, Mathematicians and st statisticians always use mu to represent, this is basically the mean or the, the center, the most likely part of the normal distribution is at mu or the mean. And then the other parameter, sigma, is known as the standard deviation. Sometimes you'll see this parameterized as sigma squared, which is the variance. Um, but, but, but basically, sig the, the variance um, is just... The, the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. So, so if you know one, you can get the others. You can either square the, the standard deviation to get the variance, or you can take the square root of the variance. Um, so um, the normal distribution has the following properties. Uh, the mode, the, the, the most likely point um, of, the of the probability density function is at, uh, is at mu is at the mean, basically. So it occurs where x equals mu. Um, and then some others, the, the, the curve is symmetric about mu, so that means, just, just to jump ahead real quickly, it means it's, it's mirrored, right? So, so if, if the mean is zero, um, you can flip it around the zero axis. It's, it's exactly the same at negative two as it is at two, it's the same value. Um, it has inflection point at plus or minus uh, one standard deviation, so at plus or minus sigma, right? So here, th this one that I drew has a, has a mean, a mu of zero, and a standard deviation of one, a sigma of one. So the, so the, the middle value is at zero, and if, if, if you go to one here, that's the point where the, 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 the slope changes from getting bigger to starting getting smaller again until we eventually get back to zero. And then again, the, the, the slope um, um, starts kind of increasing, going down this way, or decreasing if you're going back up to the top to get to that inflection point. So at, at, at sigma, at one standard deviation, then it, it, it changes again until uh, it comes back to zero on, on the tails here. So, um, so um, as, as you go, go away from the mean, it approaches zero asymptotically. So that, that's just a fancy way of saying it. Again, kind of like the Poisson, it never actually really reaches zero. So, so even however big you get here, there's some small chance you'll be 100 standard deviations away from the mean. But it's pretty negligible once you get past four standard deviations. It's really close to zero at about four or five standard deviations away from the mean. So. But it is a proper distribution, so that the area, if you integrate this, 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 the, the density, if you integrate under this function, it does sum up to 1. Right, so I think I did that right there. So, so yeah, if, if we take um, our density function and integrate it from negative infinity to infinity, uh, we get essentially one get with you know, uh, uh, you know, some error due to uh, this numerical approxi approximation. But, but this is confirming that it's essentially um, an area of one here. Right? Um, so I, I, I skipped over here, but I showed. Um, um, yeah, importing the, 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 the function from SciPy stats for the normal distribution. Uh, here, um, the, the default is to give what's known as a standard normal distribution. So a, a, a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one is known as a, norm, as a, a standard normal distribution. Um, so yeah, if you... Um, if you don't specify the, the mean and the sigma, you'll get a standard normal distribution with a mu of, of zero and a sigma of one, right? So I didn't technically have to specify those when I did that. Um, but then, yeah, it works in the same way. So I can use the PDF function on this object to get the density function, and that's how we plotted it out here. So we just plotted it from negative five to five to see what the shape of the density function was. Um, and we can use that to integrate, you know, to, to calculate probabilities, actually. Um, so here's some others. So, so, so you know, you, to understand how norm, normal distributions work, you should understand the effect of having different values of the mean and the standard deviation have on it. So we can, we can create some other normal distributions, some non-standard ones. Um, 
So like like it recruit two others and, and plot them on, or, or I just jumped down here. Recruit two others and just plot them on the same plot. So the blue one was the one, our standard normal di distribution. The green one had a mean of five um, and a sigma, a standard deviation of 0.4. So again, that means that it's central, it's mode, it's most light, it, it, the, the, the densest part of its density is at five. Yeah. So, so you see that's where it peaks. But since the, the um, since the standard deviation, um, that, that, that governs how spread out the values are in the distribution. So since it was less than one, it ends up being more pointy, right? So more of the, more of the probability is concentrated around 0.5. You're more likely to be closer to 0.5 if you're, if you're um, or sorry, uh, cl closer to five if your um, standard deviation is less than one, right? So you end up with something more pointy, so less spread out, but higher. But again, the area under this is still one, so, so it is still a proper probability density function. Um, and in the other direction, so, so here, you know, we've got one that has a mean of negative two, so it has its mode, its most dense part is, is negative two, but we made the, the, the standard deviation bigger, so that has the effect of it's more spread out, right? So, so, so you're, like, you're more likely to be further away from the mean, so, so to be have a value of two or something. Um, but again, you know, the area under this curve is going to be one. So if you integrate it, uh, it'll still sum up to one total. So. Um, so yeah, we confirm that here, right? So, so, so we just show that the area is, is one for both of these if we integrate from negative infinity to infinity. Um, and, and yeah, you can get the CDF um, from these the the norm object from scipy dot stats so so here's the the cumulative de density function for the standard normal distribution right um, so so again it's, since it's cumulative so, so th th what this means so for example at at the point zero that's where it crosses point five so that means that half of the probability is less than zero you're you're like and and that should follow you should understand that from the fact that it's symmetric around zero. So, so half of the area is less than zero, so that's why it ends up being 0.5 right there at, at the mean. And half the area is bigger, right? Um, and, and then, you know, so, so uh, most, most of the probability is, is here between negative one and one. So it goes its fastest. Uh, so the area increases the fastest between those points. And then, then as you approach negative infinity, it starts slowing down. Uh, and, and it finally becomes one as you get to infinity, basically. Um, so here, I mean, real quickly, the, 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 the big use of the cumulative de density function is it gives us a quick way to calculate probability. So if I want to know the probability of having a value between 1 and negative 1, um, so I need to calculate the area. I could integrate, so, so I could just integrate the function from negative 1 to 1, so that'd be fine. But, but of course, doing numerical integration is um, rather, um, you know, um, um, uh, this is an approximation. But it, 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 it also can be computationally kind of expensive to, to do numerical in integrals. So we can use the cumulative density function. Um, so if you just take f of 1, that's, that's the probability that it's from negative infinity up to 1. But if you subtract off the, the, the probability from negative infinity to negative 1, that, that gets rid of all this probability to left negative 1. And you're left with just the area or the probability between negative 1 and 1. So, so that is, is, is one of the main, perp main reasons for using the, the CDF, the cumulative density function. Because for, for continuous um, probability distributions, I, I, I often need to ask questions. What's the probability is between some range of values, like negative 1 and 1? So as you can see here, there's a 68%. So this is a, another thing that's good to know um, about normal distributions. Um, no matter what the, the mean and, and the variance is, there's always going to be a, a 68% chance that it's between negative 1 and 1 standard deviation away from the norm, okay? So 68% of your probability is, is plus or minus 1 standard de deviation away. So that means you have uh, basically a little bit over a 2 and 3 chance of, of, of being 1 standard deviation away from the mean. Um, and this is what's known as the... the um, The 
the, 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 the 68, 95, 99 rule. So there's, there's like a 95% chance you're within two standard deviations, okay? So, so if you look at, if you do the same thing, but, um, but um, uh, do it for, for plus, or, plus and minus two standard deviations, um, it, it'll come up with, with probably close to about 95%, right? And I won't do it again for three, but yeah, three gets you like 99.9 percent .9 actually. So, so it's, it's very unlikely to be more than three standard deviations away from the mean um, in a normal distribution. So, um, okay. So to to kind of finish off on these, um, so just, here's just a couple of examples of, of computing some. Um, um, probabilities using normal distributions. So um, um, I don't think this is exactly right, but, but I got this data. This is pretty close. So, so for example, if you were to measure the heights of men and women, uh, you'll find that, that lots of things in nature. So the reason why the normal distributions are very important is that lots of things follow normal distributions uh, that, that naturally occur. So including things like height and weight and, and other things you might measure. So, so it, it turns out that people's height are governed by uh, normal distribution. So if, if you separate between men and women, um, um, they do have, on average, have, have, have different um, properties for, for the normal distribution. So, so men, on average, have a height of 70 inches in inches with a standard deviation of 4, um, and women have, on average, a height of 66 with a standard deviation of 3. Um, I think if you look that up, those aren't quite right. Uh, so the real values are a little bit different, but but, but something like that. Um, so so if you plot those, they look something like this. Um, so, so this would give you kind of the, the probability distribution of men and women's heights, right? So you can ask questions like, what's the probability that a man is smaller than one standard deviation from the average height, right? So since the, the standard deviation is four, that's, that's the probability. What was the probability that, that a man is uh, 70 minus 4, so 66 inches or less. So, so to do that, you'd have to add up the area under the blue curve to the left of 66, right? Um, so we could integrate that if we wanted to, or we could just use the, the cumulative density function. Um, so, so basically, there's a 15% chance that you're smaller than one standard deviation. If you're a man, you're smaller than one standard deviation um, from uh, the average height of 70 inches, so that you're 66 inches or less, right? So what's the probability? So if you want to if you want to use like cumulative density functions to, to, to find probabilities that things are larger, um, you can do it like this. Uh, so it really being larger than 70 inches is just the complement of being smaller, right? So if I want to know the probability of being larger than 70 inches, if I know the the, the cumulative probability up to 70, um, uh, the the being greater than 70 has to be one minus that, since the probability has to add up to one for this to be proper. So one way you can calculate that is just one minus the cumulative of up to 70. So again, there's, there's just a bit under a 10% chance that, that uh, if you're a woman that you're 70 inches or, or taller, right? And that kind of answers the, the, the question, what probability is, is a woman of being larger than some randomly selected man, right? So since the average of height of men is 70, there's, there's a 10% chance that uh, some that, that a woman um, who's 70 inches tall would would be um, or or bigger would be big, would be bigger than a randomly selected guy basically. So. Um, okay, and then yeah, just so probably between being between 68 and 72. Um, again, you could integrate it, um, or you could just use the CDFs like we already showed. Take the difference of those. That's going to give you your probability of being in that range for men. Um, so, and this last one was kind of the same thing that I just did, but a question about what's the, what's the probability that uh, a man would be larger than than than, uh, than an average uh, woman? So. Um, Uh, 
Um, okay, so... Let me add... I'll, I'll leave that last example as, as you know, something for you to read on on your own. So, um, so w one final thing I'll mention um, in this video. So one other useful function from the SciPy stats is the .rvs functions. Um, so these are how you actually sample. So this is how you actually generate random numbers that conform to um, a, um, a random distribution, right? So if I wanted to sample random numbers, so that means generating random numbers from a, uh, a normal distribution, um, I could do something like this. So, so this is a, in reference to the previous problem here. So we're simulating this manufacturing process where we're, where we're manufacturing um, ball bearings that have a, a mean diameter of 3 and a standard deviation on the diameter of 0 0.005. Um, so here we're, we're trying to confirm that the previous results that we did, right? So, so how likely is it to have ball bearings that are more than 0 0.01 um, millimeters or whatever the, the measurement is, uh, less than or greater than the, the mean that, that we want here, right? So we can do that by using a Monte Carlo distribution where we generate uh, random ball bearings using the RVS to, to, to generate random numbers from a distribution that has a mean of 3 and a standard deviation of 0 0.005, right? Um, so if you do that, and I wish I would apply it. So if you look in the addendum, um, um, here I do kind of the same thing, but we, we draw samples from a standard normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? So I kind of want to show that again. So what, what this means, again, if you're generating random numbers, so here we're generating random numbers, but not from a uniform distribution, but, but from a normal distribution. So that means that you're most likely to get values kind of around zero. So, so here, the, the little little ticks, or the, these are called rugs. So, so I, I randomly drew um, a thousand values here. So, so, so they blend in here because most of them are concentrated around one, and 68% and of them should be between negative one and one here, right? Um, and, that, and that's kind of confirmed from, by the histogram. So the histogram, basically what, what, what we're doing is we're binning up these. So, so we just take a small interval from like zero to like negative 0.5 and we count up the number of those 1,000 um, that, that occurred between zero and negative 0.5. And that's what, what, where the height of the bar came from here. But what you should see, again, is that if you plot that against um, the, the, the true normal distribution, it, it follows, right? So, so that means that, that we're, we're most likely, we're, we're, we're having about that same probability between zero and negative 0.5. So, so that proportion of numbers were between 0 and 8.5, you know, that, that the normal distribution tells us we would expect if we're sampling or drawing from the normal distribution here. So. Um, all right, so, yeah, so, so um, kind of to summarize on this um, real quickly. Um, so in this video we covered um, a couple of different discrete and continuous probability distributions. You should be, you know, you should understand what we mean by discrete versus continuous probability distribution. So the, the random variable for the discrete case, uh, in practice, that means that you represent it by an integer, right? Zero, one, two, three, um, a whole number, basically. Uh, but for a continuous one, it's a real value number. So in practice, uh, you're going to be representing that using like a floating point value or, or a double value, right? Um, you should be familiar with, um, you know, the, these distributions, um, especially if, if uh, of any of these, uh, the one that, that you, you definitely should take some time to learn is the normal distribution. So that is used um, in many different areas. Many, it, it's very important in science and engineering and manufacturing. Um, so understanding that um, would be very helpful for probably no matter kind of what you're going to end up doing. Um, Okay, so that's it for this second video, um, and um, I will um, see you later then.